And now, another moment in the history of Stafford County. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any other state on account of sex. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. It could be argued that the beginning of the women's suffrage movement began right here in Stafford County. And that's because the first woman in America to request the right to vote lived in Stafford for nearly 20 years. I never doubted that equal rights was the right direction. Most reforms, most problems are complicated. But to me, there is nothing complicated. But to me, there is nothing complicated about ordinary equality. Alice Paul, 1910. Margaret Brent is one of the leading ladies of Stafford County. She fled to Stafford to escape religious upheaval in Maryland in 1650. But before she moved here, she worked as a feminist activist in Maryland during the middle of the 17th century. Margaret Brent arrived in Maryland in 1638 with their sister Mary and brothers Giles and Folk. They were members of a landed Catholic family in Gloucestershire, England. They came to America in part to escape civil war in England and in part to find religious tolerance far from home. Maryland was originally intended to be a refuge for immigrant Catholics, but its overseer, Cecil Calvert, known in England as Lord Baltimore, wanted his colony to bring him increased wealth and power. To ensure the success of the colony, he decided to allow Protestants and Catholics to immigrate there together. In this way, Maryland became something of an experiment in religious tolerance uncommon for the times. It was we, the people, not the white male citizens, nor yet we the male citizens, but we the whole people who formed the Union. And we formed it not to give the blessings of liberty, but to secure them, not to the half of ourselves and the half of our posterity, but to the whole people, women as well as men. Susan B. Anthony, 1856. Women were not granted many political rights in colonial times. They were traditionally housewives. Tending the children and keeping the home clean were their main priorities, but not for Brent. Margaret Brent never married. She remained single throughout her life. But the ratio of men to women in 17th century Maryland was six to one. So the pressure to wed must have been intense. Nevertheless, Brent chose to remain single. And that decision had a profound impact on her life. Although Margaret and her sister Mary came to America with their brothers, they never entered into business with them. Giles settled on Kent Island, where he led his own colony, and folks went back to England. That left Margaret to manage her own affairs, which she seemed to enjoy doing. She soon amassed some of the largest real estate holdings in the New World. And to secure those holdings, Margaret was compelled to engage in regular business and legal proceedings in the colony. The best protection any woman can have is courage. Elizabeth Caddy Stanton, 1848. As a single landowner with considerable fortune, Margaret Brent became a de facto attorney by necessity. She appeared in court without any assistance and handled her affairs as men would have done. In fact, according to official records of the colonial courts in Maryland, she brought some 124 cases before the colonial court. While some of them were on her behalf, most were on the behalf of others. Her clients varied from large landowners like herself to the indigent, who were not normally represented by counsel. On more than a few occasions, the causes and cases she pursued were not particularly popular with the colonial establishment, but that didn't seem to deter her in the least. Perhaps all of this doesn't seem too remarkable today. After all, in the second decade of the 21st century, nearly 50% of the students graduating from law school are women. But Brent didn't live in our world. She lived in a world some 365 years before women would be allowed to vote. And in this strange colonial era, she successfully engaged in the practice of law. I think with never-ending gratitude that the young women of today do not and can never know at what price their right to free speech and to speak at all in public has been earned. Lucy Stone, 1856. Although the Brents had left England and immigrated to Maryland to escape religious persecution and civil strife, it found them again in 1645. 
and that year a Protestant ship arrived to the Maryland settlement to lead an attack on the Catholic settlers there. The governor, Leonard Calvert, brother to Lord Baltimore, pledged his whole estate to raise an army in defense of the colony, although he himself fled to Virginia where he died, but not before leaving his trusted friend Margaret Brent as executor of the estates in charging paying off his debts. It was in this capacity that Brent stood before the Maryland Assembly and requested the right to vote. The soldiers the governor hired to fend off the invasion of Maryland were demanding their pay and there was a shortage of food. Calvert did not have sufficient funding to pay these dues, so it was left up to Brent to find a way to solve the crisis. With Calvert's soldiers threatening mutiny, Brent averted disaster for the colony by having the assembly transferred to her, Leonard Calvert's power of attorney for his brother, Lord Baltimore, who remained in England. Brent used his power to sell off some of Lord Baltimore's cattle to pay off the soldiers. Her decisive action helped resolve the crisis and ensure the survival of the Maryland settlement. It was as a part of this action that Brent stood alone before an all-male assembly on January 21st, 1648, to ask for two votes. One vote was in recognition of her rights as a landowner. The second vote was in her role as Lord Baltimore's official attorney. This, coupled with the appointment of a new Protestant governor in Maryland, drove the Brents to move to the Virginia frontier, where they eventually owned nearly 11,000 acres of land and began a plantation which Margaret named Peace. I think nothing is religion which puts one individual absolutely above others, and surely nothing is religion which puts one sex above another. Julia Ward Howe, 1893. Margaret Brent did not succeed in becoming the first woman in America to gain the right to vote. That distinction belonged to Mrs. Marie Ruff Byron, who became the first woman to officially vote on August 31st, 1920 under the newly passed 19th Amendment to the Constitution. But no one would disagree that Margaret Brent was a person of unusual force of personality and courage, that she displayed in the course of her lifetime a spirit of independence and a yearning for justice and equality. Characteristics that would later fuel not only the American dream itself, but the dreams and ambitions of courageous women of the suffrage movement in America and across the globe. And there you have it, in a Stafford Minute.